welcome everyone um, to our event. We're here to um, talk about uh, uh, this wonderful book that, that Ruth, you've written, the book of um, Form and Emptiness. Ooh, yeah. There we go. And, and in conversation with the Hearing Voices Network. Um, uh, and, and in particular, we have a couple, couple folks from HVN USA here. Um, and just to say a couple things, so I mean, uh, Ruth will have you say a little bit more about the book in a moment, but it's been, um, you've written this really wonderful book that, that is about a young boy who hears voices and, and sort of the world that he's living in. And, and it's, um, it's quite the book. I mean, it's quite a beautiful book to read and I think has also been, been um, very well received and celebrated as mm -hmm. at, rightly so. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, so it also then gives us an opportunity to talk about some of these experiences of mm -hmm. voice hearing and experiencing visions and, and all of this terrain that you've um, covered. And so we really wanted to kind of take this moment of, of, um, of, this cultural moment to say, well, let's talk about, let's talk about this book. Let's talk about our own experiences with voices and visions and, and this terrain. Um, and so it's really, we're really grateful for, to ISPS US and HVN USA for hosting us here today. Um, and this is also a, a fundraiser. So if you're uh, you, the, 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 uh, if you paid anything into coming, um, then that will be going to HVN USA and, and also to ISPS US and, and there's a link that um, I think Leah will be sharing in the chat if you'd like to make an additional donation. And part of this, um, so this money will, especially on the HVN USA side, is just going to helping people get plugged in to support um, people who hear voices uh, or experience visions, their family members, offer trainings. You know, we're really um, doing this work to, to support people. And, and so if you're able to make um, a donation, big or small, that is uh, very much, very much appreciated. Um, and yeah, so thank you to, to ISPS and HVN USA and, and uh, Ramey Blasco was a really big part in bringing, bringing us all together here today. And um, she's faring through the hurricanes down mm -hmm. south. And um, but just wanted to, to shout out to Ramey and everyone who's helped make today possible. Um, and let's just start with, um, we'll have lots more to say, but let's just start with just maybe a couple minutes each from um, Ruth and Claire and Jeannie, each of our, our speakers and panelists today, just a couple minutes, whatever you'd like to say about yourself and, and who you are um, what, or what brings you to this panel. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I'll have Ruth talk a little bit about the book and, and, and we'll kind of open up the conversation, but yeah, just, just brief introductions from everyone, please. Um, okay, Ruth, well, do you want to should I start? Sure. Yeah, sure. that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so my name's Ruth Ozeki, and I'm a novelist and a uh, Zen Buddhist priest, and also a teacher, college teacher. Um, I teach creative writing at Smith College, and um, I'm going to be talking a lot about myself later. So <laughs> I think I'm just going to. I'd like to pass it on to to Claire and to Jeannie, if that's okay, um, because you'll you'll just be hearing me go on and on later on. So. <laughs> Claire, maybe I could pass it to you. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, I'm a Chinese immigrant and voice here and author. My memoir, Hearing Voices Living Fully, was published in 2016. I was born in Hong Kong to a refugee family that had fled Shanghai just weeks before Mao's troops marched into the city. And my sister Elaine remembers seeing people being taken away to be shot. Um, by the time I was born, the then 14 years of my parents' marriage had been filled with warfare and refugee flight, first from the Japanese and then from the communists. And my family immigrated to the United States in 1955 when I was three and a half years old. And I subscribe to the, um, to the belief that the conditions and vulnerabilities that lead to hearing voices are primarily born of trauma in its various forms. And my particular traumas were maternal distress during gestation. My mother said goodbye to her family in 1951 when I was in utero to say that we were coming to the United States and immigration before age four and you know, mild racism. Um, and, and various other things. But um, I, I am not a, a person who has experienced um, physical or psychological abuse. Um, um, and I would like to pass it on to Jeannie. 
Hi, so I'm Jeannie Bass again. Um, I just want to say before I tell you about myself, I just want to say something real quick to add on to what Derek said about the fundraiser. Um, so just to put it out there, HVN USA is totally volunteer staffed. We have no funding. Um, I'll put a plug out, but it's the truth. Caroline Carlton answers all our emails and every single day of the week, she answers hundreds of emails from struggling voice hearers, parents, you know, loved ones all different people around the country that are really just desperate for support and um, connection with other people who understand um, the system doesn't do a very good job of giving people the support they need. Um, and as our website stands now, we don't, it's, it's barely functional. Um, our forums are no longer up. It's very difficult to navigate finding a group. So anything people can contribute um, is, is very, um, appreciated and, and could really change lives. Um, so I just don't mean that lightly. And um, just to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a tiny little island um, in Massachusetts um, and with a lot of trauma, a lot of different, really difficult experiences. And, um, you know, I was in the system for a couple decades. It took them a long time to convince me of my illness. I fought against it for a very long time. Um, but once I embraced that narrative and had sort of given up to letting people live my life for me mm -hmm. um, and just sort of coexisted with my voices running my life as well, um, I kind of, you know, life threw me a curveball when I found HVN. And, you know, that was really the first time I started to understand even what trauma was. No one had ever <laughs> presented that idea to me of all these horrific things being, you know, my being a trauma survivor. Um, I do believe that trauma is partly why I hear voices. I also think that trauma has opened me up to different sensitivities that allow for, you know, my voices to come from other places like spirituality or, you know, I often experience voices that are triggered by really just the noise and stress in my life, um, the pressure. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. I hope that there, if there are other voice hearers that have never been able to hear from people that hear voices, um, that you find this a comfort and realize that you're not alone. So thank you everyone for being here. Thanks, thanks Jeannie and thanks everybody. Um, and just to um, give people a sense of, of the, uh, the layout today. So we'll, um, in a moment, we'll hear a bit more from Ruth and, and a bit more about this book um, the book of form and emptiness that, that is sort of our jumping off point in, into this conversation. Um, and from there, we're hoping to open it up to a conversation between the, the panelists. Um, and we can ask each other questions. We can, you know, I have sort of a list of questions we've, we've talked about, and we'll also just be, be seeing kind of how the, how the conversation evolves. Um, and if you are wanting to ask a question, we'll have a time for Q&A at the end. Um, we're scheduled to go today until um, 4.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, which is 7.30 p.m. Eastern time and many other time zones, it's other times. We'll also be <laughs> recording this today. So you can, um, if you have to leave at any point, you know, we'll, there will be a, a, a link that I think will be on the ISPS um, website and I think on on YouTube or it'll be out there and I think you'll get a you'll get um you registered for the event today so if you'll get a um a link with that um and I can say too just a word about myself so I'll be moderating and I I live here in southern Oregon um and have been sort of loosely connected to the hearing voices movement um for uh, 10 10 years or so, something like that and I am also someone who's experienced voices and visions and kind of this broad terrain which I really think is part of the human experience. I mean, I, I think this is just sort of part, you know, there, are, as Jeannie and Claire were saying, there's trauma and there's all these other mm -hmm. things that can open us up. And there's also just this vast, mysterious, terrifying, wonderful human experience. And, um, and, and so I, my, my, my experience of voices and visions tend to come and go and, and throughout sort of different periods of my life. Um, and I'm also involved in, in co-facilitate or yeah, helping facilitate one of the online west coast groups through hvn usa so it's really exciting to be here with all of you and um ruth maybe you could just start us off by saying a little bit about um 
the book uh, that you've written and, and maybe reading uh, reading from it too, because I, uh, I think the book is in a way a panelist here as well. So yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, if you could just sort of bring 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 us all into this world. That's that's lovely. That's a really nice way of putting it. I think the book is a panelist uh, for sure, a, a part you know a participant. Um, so the the book of form and emptiness is um, it, it tells the story of a young boy named Benny O who um, in the wake of his dad's death uh, starts to hear first the vo first his father's voice, but then um, sort of moves into the voices of objects and things in his house um, that are speaking to him. Um, and very often he can't, he can't understand the language that they're, um, that they're speaking in, but there's a sense that he has of a kind of feeling tone um, uh, you know, to these various different kinds of, of voices. And, um, and one of the voices is, uh, in, is a very special voice. Um, and in fact, the entire book is sort of constructed as a dialogue between Benny and this other voice, this special voice, um, which is the voice of the book itself. So um, it, the, the Book of Form and Emptiness is the narrator of the Book of Form and Emptiness and is in conversation with, in dialogue with Benny. And um, so it, it sort of raises the question, um, you know, that they're kind of narrating each other into being, you know, which comes first, the, the chicken or the egg, which comes first, uh, the boy or the book. Um, and, and in fact, it's, it's, the, it's the conversation between them. Um, through which the story emerges. Um, and, you know, um, very often, I think in, in all cases, in all of my, my work, um, uh, books come to me um, as voices. Um, they, they, you know, it's either the character of, of the, you know, the, sorry, the voice of the character, or it can be very often the, the tone or the voice of the book itself. And, um, and so that's why I was thinking it would be nice maybe to read just a little bit from the beginning um, so that you can hear the voices the way that I hear them um, and the way that they came to me. Uh, so I, I hope that's okay um, if, I, if I just read a little bit from the beginning. In the beginning. A book must start somewhere. One brave letter must volunteer to go first, laying itself on the line in an act of faith from which a word takes heart and follows, drawing a sentence into its wake. From there, a paragraph amasses and soon a page, and the book is on its way, finding a voice, calling itself into being. A book must start somewhere, and this one, starts here. A boy. Shh, listen. That's my book, and it's talking to you. Can you hear it? It's okay if you can't, though. It's not your fault. Things speak all the time, but if your ears aren't attuned, you have to learn to listen. You can start by using your eyes because eyes are easy. Look at all the things around you. What do you see? A book, obviously, and obviously the book is speaking to you, so try something more challenging. The chair you're sitting on, the pencil in your pocket, the sneaker on your foot. Still can't hear? Then get down on your knees and put your head to the seat, or take off your shoe and hold it to your ear. No, wait, if there are people around, they'll think you're mad, so try it with the pencil first. Pencils have stories inside them and they're safe as long as you don't stick the point in your ear. Just hold it next to your head and listen. Can you hear the wood whisper, the ghost of the pine, the mutter of lead? Sometimes it's more than one voice. Sometimes it's a whole chorus of voices rising from a single thing, especially if it's a made thing with lots of different makers. But don't be scared. I think it depends on the kind of day they were having back in Guangdong or Laos or wherever. And if it was a good day at the old sweatshop, if they were enjoying a pleasant thought at the moment when that particular grommet came tumbling down the line and passed through their fingers, then that pleasant thought will cling to the whole. Sometimes it's not so much a thought as a feeling, a nice warm feeling, like love, for example, sunny, 
and yellow. But when it's a sad feeling or an angry one that gets laced into your shoe, then you better watch out because that shoe might do crazy shit, like march your feet right up to the front of the Nike store, for example, where you could wind up smashing the display window with a baseball bat made of furious wood. If that happens, it's still not your fault. Just apologize to the window and say I'm sorry to the glass. And whatever you do, don't try to explain. The arresting officer doesn't care about the crappy conditions in the bat factory. He won't care about the chainsaws or the sturdy ash tree that the bat used to be. So just keep your mouth shut. Stay calm, be polite, remember to breathe. It's really important not to get upset because then the voices will get the upper hand and take over your mind. Things are needy, they take up space. They want attention, and they'll drive you mad if you let them. So just remember, you're like the air traffic controller. No, wait, you're like the leader of a big brass band made up of all the jazzy stuff of the planet. And you're floating out there in space, standing on this great garbage heap of a world with your hair slicked back and your natty suit and your stick up in the air, surrounded by all the eager things. And for one quick, beautiful moment, All their voices go silent, waiting till you bring your baton down. Music or madness, it's totally up to you. The book. So start with the voices then. When did he first hear them? When he was still little? Benny was always a small boy and slow to develop as though his cells were reluctant to multiply and take up space in the world. It seems he pretty much stopped growing when he turned 12, the same year his father died and his mother started putting on weight. The change was subtle, but Benny seemed to shrink as Annabelle grew, as if she were metabolizing her small son's grief along with her own. Yes, that seems right. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, I see little hearts floating. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Derek, go oh, ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you so much for yeah, bringing our, uh, our fourth panelist into the room here. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Fourth and, yeah, and fifth, really. There's two of yeah. since there's oh, okay, two of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything um, you you know? I, I'm wondering if there's anything you want to say, um, sort of, by way, you know, by further mm-hmm. introduction of, of of what brought you to bring to to write yeah. about this book, and what was what was kind of some of the personal some of the personal motivation and and. Sure. Yeah, and how did hearing voices and these experiences become so so central to the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's I think all of my books always have something deeply personal at their core, at their heart. Um, something that has happened to me usually, um, and that I'm trying to figure out. And very often these are things that happened when I was when I was quite young. I mean, I think some of our, you know, m- most potent you know, the most potent things that have the most kind of psychological impact happen when we're really quite young. And, and so we spend the rest of our lives trying to understand it and, and, and figure it out. Um, but for me, uh, so one of the things, the, the things that happened, um, uh, like Benny, you know, I lost my dad, not when, not when I was as young as him, but when I was, when I was older. Um, and for about a year after my dad died, um, I, I would hear his voice and it was, it was very distinctive. It always happened when I was doing something pretty ordinary, like washing the dishes or, um, or folding the laundry, you know, just something ordinary around the house. And I would, um, I would hear him and it was always kind of behind me on the right-hand side, you know, there's a place where 
he was. And, um, and I would hear him clear his throat and then, and he had a very distinctive way of clearing his throat, which I would always recognize. And he would clear his throat and then he would say my name. And every time this happened, you know, I would, I would turn around expecting to see him. And, and of course, then I would remember that, that he was dead. And, um, and every time this happened, it was like, you know, getting that kick in the stomach, you know, that punch in the stomach where, you know, you, you feel the grief, you feel the grief all over again. And, um, and yet the, at the same time, these episodes were, um, they were very, very quick. Um, so quick that I was able to pretty much ignore them, right? And um, until the next time it happened. And then it was like, oh, right, that's happened before. Um, so maybe it happened five or six times over the course of about a year. And, and then indeed it stopped. Right. Um, and so this was something this was uh, this was uh, an experience that I gave to Benny um, that I shared with Benny. Um, in Benny's case, of course, um, the the voices of his dad sort of fade away and then he starts to tune in to you know, the voices of objects in the house and the voices of, you know, of, of things outside, you know, the house and at school. And um, uh, it doesn't help that his mother, Annabelle, um, she works as a, um, as a news clipper, right? And so she's constantly listening. I mean, their voice is in the house all the time. Um, you know, she's been sent, her office is closed. She's been sent home to work from home. And we all know what happens, you know, when that, <laughs> we all know what happens when, when that happens, right? Um, but she's listening to radio and she's listening to the news and she's listening to television. And there's just, the house is filled with voices. And, um, and Annabelle is also a bit of a hoarder. Um, she's using, you know, some retail therapy to kind of deal with her grief. Um, and so the house is filled with objects and, and all of the objects um, have, have voices associate, associated with them as well. Um, and so Benny, you know, um, Benny, uh, you know, the voices follow him to school. Um, he gets in trouble at school. Um, he's sent to see a psychiatrist. Um, and he's put on a uh, pediatric psych ward for observation. Um, you know, he, he, he talks about the voices and, and then um, is, is uh, uh, confined to a locked ward. Um, and this was something else that, uh, again, came from personal experience. Um, when I was uh, a little older than Benny, Benny's about 14 or 15 when this happens. Um, but when I was, when I was uh, 16 or 17, um, I had what was then and called a nervous breakdown. And, um, you know, this was back in the olden days when, you know, before diagnosis was not, you know, the, the fine art that it is now. And, um, and, and so I had a, I had this nervous breakdown and was, um, was uh, sent to a locked ward and, and stayed there for several months. And so the, um, the kinds of experiences that Benny had on that ward uh, were very much based on um, the kinds of experiences that, that I had had as well. Um, and so it was a way of, I think writing the book was um, a way of uh, sort of thinking about voices, right? And thinking about these kinds of um, experiences that, uh, you know, that um, are not in our culture considered, you know, they're considered abnormal, they're considered pathological. Um, and, and two, and the last Point I'll make here is that um, you know as a writer uh, I hear voices all the time um, you know the voices of my characters speak to me um, and that's you know that's that's where the the books come from and I was I remember I was talking to a group in a library um, about exactly this about how you know novels come to me as voices and um, a man in the audience raised his hand um, at the end. And he asked me, you know, did I mean that literally? You know, when I talked about, you know, the characters speaking to me, you know, and listening to the characters' voices, did I mean that literally? And the reason he asked was because he had a son who was a voice hearer. And his son's voices um, were very, very disturbing to him, right? Um, very much unlike the experience that I was describing. And, um, and so we got into a conversation about this and, um, and I explained that, um, you know, he, he said that his son heard voices, you know, as if with his ear, as if they were outside his head. And this was disturbing. Um, and this, the voices were very critical, 
right? And, um, and I explained that, no, you know, the voices of my characters, when they come to me, it's a more internal process. It's, it's, I can, it's like I can hear them with my mind and they're inside my head. But I had had this experience when my dad died of hearing voices that were outside, you know, the outside and hearing them with my ear. And it also made me start to realize that, you know, as a, as a writer, as a, um, as a novelist, as a human being, <laughs> um, you know, we have these, uh, this cast, I have this cast of characters um, inside me who are um, always, you know, talking to me and always critical and always telling me that whatever it is that I'm writing um, sucks, right? And that, um, that uh, nobody's going to be interested in this, um, that it's uh, selfish, it's self-involved, um, you know, uh, it's just a waste of time. Uh, I could be doing other things that were helpful. Why don't I go out and get a real job, you know? And so I'm very familiar with these uh, voices and I, you know, I work with them all the time. And so that's when I guess I started to really think about voice hearing as, you know, a kind of spectrum in the sense that, you know, some of these voices are like the voices of inspiration, you know, and, um, and I'm lucky enough to live in a culture where, um, you know, the voices that I hear and write in my, you know, in my novels, these unshared experiences um, that I write um, and put in novels so that they can be shared, right? Um, that these are, are, I'm lucky enough that these are celebrated, right? These kinds of voices are celebrated. Um, and these neurotic voices, well, you know, we all have them, you know, and so they're kind of, they, they fall into a mid, mid category. And then they're the voices um, that, you know, if you, if you tell your, you know, your psychiatrist that you're, um, I always think about Jung and how Jung talked about his voices and, um, and, I, and how he could control them and how he could control his visions. Um, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, if Jung, Carl Jung um, told that to a psychiatrist nowadays, you know, mm, maybe he wouldn't be believed, you know, maybe he would be put in a locked ward too. Um, so just this idea of, you know, voices as, uh, you know, uh, you know, this diversity of voices and, and, um, and what would that, you know, what would that look like? And, and why is it that some are considered normal, you know, and some are considered pathological? Um, the idea of normal is a, you know, is a cultural construct. It's a fiction, right? <laughs> um, I'm a fiction writer. I can recognize it as a fiction. And, um, and so if it's a fiction, you know, why can't we change it? You know, why can't we rewrite it? Why can't we expand it and make it more generous and make it more compassionate? you know, make it more all inclusive. So anyway, long answer to the question, but that that's kind of what went into my thinking as I was as I was working on the book. Thanks, Ruth. I really thanks for sharing all of that with us. And it, yeah. it really you brought both the book and your own story um, in into the the room, so to speak here in, in a really lovely way. And thank you. Um, and before we kind of before, so before we open it up to our to our panelists and kind of our conversation, maybe it's helpful to just say a couple more words about this Hearing Voices network that we keep keep kind of referencing for because there may be different ways people are ending up on this call, and um, I do see some people in the in the chat sharing about some of their own experiences um, as voice hearers, which is just really lovely to have have so many folks from our from our community here. Um, but I will say, you know, so the Hearing Voices Network um, began in the late 80s in the in the Netherlands and was actually created by um, a voice here, Patsy Haig, and uh, there was a journalist, Sandra Escher, and Marius Ram was a, um, a psychiatrist or psychologist, you know, somewhere along those lines. Um, and and is a, the Hearing Voices Network, it's a, there, there are groups that meet all around the world at this point, um, and they're peer based, they're, they're there may, sometimes we have allies, you know, people who are not voice hearers themselves or don't experience visions themselves who are helping facilitate meetings, but it, it is led sort of by, by and for um, our, our community. And, and we do these support groups as a, uh, as a place where people can come and talk and be together in community. And there's also a lot of um, educational events and trainings that folks have been creating and sharing and generating. And um, I'll say just to just to sort of evoke the Hearing Voices Network, um, 
we, we talk about uh, here in the States, we talk about the three freedoms, uh, which are the freedom to interpret experiences in any way, not just an illness framework, the freedom to challenge social norms, including gender norms and the groups I've been a part of also added uh, racial stereotypes, um, the freedom to challenge these norms or other ideas about how we're supposed to be in the world and the freedom to talk about anything, not just voices and visions. Um, and although, you know, we're really rooted in uh, the experiences of voice hearers, but as the years have gone by and, um, and the Hearing Voices Network has been here in the United States for, I think 2005 was maybe when the, when the group started coming over um, from, from uh, mostly from Europe and, um, and I think HVN USA as a sort of body uh, with a with a charter, you know, was created, I think, in 2010. Um, and, uh, and, and some folks may have read, you know, there was a book, Agnes's Jacket, a nonfiction book that, that talked about the hearing voices approach that came out a number of years ago, and more recently, a book called The Mind in the Moon, uh, you know, another nonfiction book that um, that has been just a way of sharing this. Uh, and so we, 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 as we were preparing for this webinar, we said, well, how do we, how do we frame our conversation? How do we frame our, oh. oh. I'm trying to, uh, I've got my background <laughs> blurred. <laughs> I'm trying to do a plug for Agnes's jacket here, <laughs> but I've got my black, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, and also just to say, just to, you know, so we were talking about how do we, oh, there we go, Agnes's jacket. Yeah. Agnes's jacket, there you go. <laughs> um, and yeah, and we were thinking, how do we frame this conversation? And we thought, well, maybe we, in some ways, this conversation it is like a Hearing Voices Network group where we can um, ask each other questions. You know, I have, I have some questions I'll maybe ask the panelists, but we're also, we can respond to one another. We can um, often in the Hearing Voices Network rather than, you know, when, when, when for many of us, if we have to start having these experiences and we end up in some variation of the mental health system, very quickly, there's a, this is what's wrong with you. Here's what you need to do. And, and believing anything different is part of your illness. You know, there's even, a, there's even a diagnosis for if you don't believe the doctor, that's sort of something wrong with you. Um, and, and, and part of the Hearing Voices Network is a human rights-based approach, which is we start from the premise that our experiences are real and valid and that they can, be, they can be incredibly meaningful, they can be incredibly distressing, but we're here together um, exploring the train and supporting each other. And so often in Hearing Voices groups, rather than giving each other advice, um, we approach each one another with curiosity and, and sort of with this um, deep respect for one another's experiences and knowing that um, how I'm understanding my experiences today might be different next year, but, but being met, um, meeting each other with our experiences and what's that like for you? That sounds really hard. You know, I, um, even if I don't share that experience in the moment, I, I don't, um, I wasn't aware you were the president of the United States, but it sounds really stressful. You know, how are you dealing with that? Right? Like we can actually meet each other and see one another's humanity there. Um, so that's a long, a long spiel, but just to say, well, um, we will be having talking now for, um, uh, 30, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q and A at the end. And if you're for for the audience members, and we really want to hear from all of you, so in your little Zoom um, there, there's a button where you can see Q and A. It's different from the chat, and you can if you ask questions in the Q and A, then we'll see them and 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 help that you know we can we can um, depending on how many we may not get to all of them, but we hope to you know we we will get to your questions and are really looking forward to them. Um, and once again, if you're moved to make a donation to ISPS and HVN USA to help spread HVN USA, Leah is sharing that link in the chat. So that's a long, uh, now let's, let's sort of open it up into our conversation. And um, Claire and Jeannie, I wonder, um, you know, we've heard, we heard this really lovely introduction from Ruth of the book, and we've been talking about HVN, and, and of course you two are both um, very involved in HVN USA and on the board. And I wonder, is there anything um, as, you know, as voice hearers reading, reading Ruth's book, um, is there anything you'd like to say kind of about your experience of reading it and what it evoked, uh, anything it evoked for you personally in, in, in your own lives? Um, yeah, sure. So. 
Um, I really love the book. Um, and I guess for me, um, what I love the most was that the way that Ruth structured the book, the way that the writing all came together, it was not, you know, the me medical model treatment was way in the background, really, if you look at, mm -hmm. you know, the whole spectrum, but we could really see Benny's life. We could really see Annabelle's life. We could feel that deep, like gut clenching loneliness that they each had in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and we watched that loneliness really drive the storylines. Um, we got to know Benny as, you know, someone coming of age, but also someone coming of age alone. Mm -hmm. um, him and Annabelle had very little to no support that was viable in any way to what they needed. Um, and for me, that really really um, evokes a lot as to where HVN USA um, fills in those gaps for people. Um, you know, it is a very scary, lonely experience, um, even when your voices feel big and exciting. Um, but but to try to navigate and, and untangle what's happening to you and, you know, for family members to figure out what's happening and how to support people. Um, we just, as a society, we don't offer that to people. And really, probably the thing that stops people from, you know, learning to live with their voices the most is society's reaction to the way people hear voices and with fear. And so I just felt that the book, you know, when I was done with it, I read a lot. And I often, when I finish books, I'll say to myself, what, like, because I love quotes, what quote really kind of sums up this book? And immediately I thought of, um, uh, one of my favorite quotes, which is the Friedrich Nietzsche quote, um, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who cannot hear the music. Mm. And I think, you know, Ruth brought us Benny and he was dancing. And I think that Ruth could really hear the music. And she invited all of us as the readers in to hear that music. Um, and that is a very special thing, especially to see a child. I mean, the book was on Amazon's top 100 books, Ruth. I, don't, I have to put a plug <laughs> in for that. So, you know, there are a lot of people reading this book that maybe had no exposure to people that hear voices. And to get this humanized story is so very different from what is out there. I could, I don't want to bash any other books, but I could name books that really they don't offer that, um, that different narrative. So that that's where I saw. It. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is um, the way the book used stories, not just books, but stories as like really, you know, what carried us in the book, HBN USA, we have a tagline, you know, we do have this tagline, a lot of things happen in HBN groups, right? You learn new strategies, you meet friends, you figure out new ways of understanding your voices. But for many, many years, all across the world, people have said, well, what's an HBN group? You know, what happens there? And it's really sharing our stories, no more, no less. Yeah. And that is, I believe what, you know, the book of form and emptiness did as well. Um, so I, I feel that, you know, uh, I'm really appreciative of the book. So thank you. Thanks. I also really loved the book and loved the fact that it is set in a lot. Parts of it are set in a library. <laughs> and um, Certainly Benny's experience, particularly um, his grief um, at the loss of his father. Um, my father died when I was 25 and I was still very much unsettled in my life, um, having, um, I didn't begin hearing voices till I was 31 years old, but I had throughout my life experienced that quiet inner voice that I called instinct that would always mm -hmm. appear. You know, I would just know I'd be at a decision-making point. And then I would think, I would think and think and think, and then I would just know. I don't know the source of that, but I did call it instinct. When my father died in an accident, um, when I was still very much a cause of concern for him and my mother, I was grief stricken and my grief was as palpable as Benny's. 
And um, in for decades following his death, I would have recurring dreams where it was a premature burial and he was alive and he was there. And I would um, prepare in my dream to run up to him and tell him that, you know, that, that I thought I had had a horrible dream that he died and want to throw my arms around him and then I'd wake up. Mm. And, um, and I realize now, you know, that he came at times when I was at a decision making point, or at, um, you know, potentially crisis, but, but mm -hmm. some transition. And um, I also during my second extended departure of, of more than a year, I've had three um, from the 1989 to 92 time frame, he was very present. Mm -hmm. My um, the the presences that I called my guardian angels, God, you know, um, various gave them various names would speak to him and speak to me. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like the emissaries between the two of us, and they always assured my father that I would be fine. Um, so that too was. Um, it wasn't similar to what was um, precisely to to the ways in which you've described Benny, but I think the um, the things that led me to uh, I, I I'm sorry I mm -hmm. I'm really going into my own story. That's around. okay. No, of course. Yeah. This is but, what this is what's so beautiful about fiction is that it allows this to happen, right? Fiction. Yes draws it out you know so your your story adds to benny's story in, in a beautiful way yes so and, please and, keep going yeah yeah in, in some sense you know we um you know both being you know i being fully chinese but brought up to be as american yeah. as possible so perhaps more akin to benny than one might yeah. think yeah. in yeah. my yeah. uh the my the mix of my blood yeah. um and i The other thing that I really loved about your book was the, you know, the um, the ways in which um, the Aleph and Slavaj um, interacted with Benny. I have worked for nonprofit human services agencies. You so humanized mm -hmm. people that you know are viewed often as outcasts, mm -hmm. and I have known so many. Um, people who have been in the system and are in their 60s and are brilliant and but because they were consigned to you know to given these diagnoses and really thrown away by society by the system they really never learned to um they were never given the opportunity to really live a life mm -hmm. Um, and didn't have the kinds of supports that ultimately Benny will have mm -hmm. as a result of um, the connections he made with um, Alice, um, the Alaf, and <laughs> Lodge. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that. And I, I also especially, I, I imagine, and I, I believe it to be true, and please tell me if I'm not yeah. correct, but you know, the opening paragraph of your book okay you know, where one, um, a book must start somewhere, one brave letter must <laughs> you know, um, start and then be followed by others. And, and I, I took it to be a metaphor for the hearing voices movement. And I, I don't know that yeah. that's correct, yeah. but I yeah. love the idea of that and love the idea that your book is going to be so important, mm -hmm. is so important in sort of opening people's um eyes, minds, and hearts to the possibility that there is so much more to um, those who, the people who um, have been given diagnoses mm -hmm. and have been assigned a certain place in, um, in society, in the world, mm -hmm. and that that is so untrue, given the kinds of supports that the Hearing Voices Network can provide mm -hmm. the fact that community shared experiences mm -hmm. the fact that normalizing that which to most of society is um not understood you know that grossly mm -hmm. misunderstood and um feared and if people were honest you know there's so much in literature in song you know gets you on your way his 
your wavelength on. Mm -hmm. She gets mm -hmm. you on her wavelength and lets the, you know, whatever wavelength, you mm -hmm. know. Um, anyway, I'm, I am rambling as is my want. So I'm going to start <laughs> or stop right now. I, I would love to, can I just respond to, to what Claire um, and, and also to Jeannie? Um, uh, so one of the things that I really believe about novels is that, or and fiction or novels, I, mostly about novels, I think nonfiction too, but particularly fiction, is that, um, that, you know, we think about a book, you know, as being a singular object, right? So this is the book of form and emptiness, right? And we think of it as a singular object, but I think of it as a relationship. And, um, and so, you know, when it, it made me so happy to listen to you talk about, you know, the kinds of associations in your own experience and, you know, and, and the way that you bring your lived experience and Jeannie, you bring your lived experience to the page. And even though, you know, I mean, I, I wrote it, you know, but I'm not there when you're doing that, right? When you're reading the book, but you bring your lived experience to the page. And at that point, we become collaborators, right? So that we are really co-creating a unique book of form and emptiness that is unlike anyone else's, right? So it, it, there are, you know, there are as many different books of form and emptiness as there are readers who will read them because readers bring their own very particular, you know, and very unique and very special lived experience to the page. And, um, and, and that just seems to me to be kind of magic, you know, and, and it also, this idea that, um, that we, so in other words, I can't do it alone, right? I, I can't write a book by myself because Without you, the book is meaningless, right? Um, and so that also um, sort of maps nicely onto the, um, you know, the peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, um, uh, model for um, for dialogue, for support, for you know, for for doing this kind of work, be it in fiction or be it in you know what we call real life, you know, and. Um, one of the things that was very clear to me uh, right from the start um, was that uh, that Benny was going to that the story is really about Benny finding community, right? It's about him finding peers in you know unlikely places. You know what what boy goes and you know plays hooky and goes to a library, but he does, right? And that's where he meets you know, the bottle man, this Slovenian poet philosopher who's lost a leg and, you know, collects bottles and, and cans and, um, you know, wheels himself around the city in a wheelchair, right? And, and really it's the, it's the bottle man, Slavoj, who teaches Benny, right? How to, because he's a poet and he's a philosopher and he teaches Benny, you know, how to listen, you know, to the voices of things that really matter and how to hear you know, and, and speak with his own, you know, his own voices. So this idea of, you know, of, of uh, you know, uh, liberation through community is something that uh, was very much at the heart of the, you know, the process when I was, um, when I was writing this, so. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about hearing voices network groups is, um, like Derek mentioned, they started in the Netherlands, but the first group actually took place in a psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. So we have community right out. We think of community out like, you know, groups held in a community center or yeah. peer, you know, drop in center or something like that. Um, but groups happen in really unexpected places. Communities happen mm -hmm. in really mm -hmm. unexpected places. I work, you know, my day job, I work as the director of peer support at a public um, psychiatric hospital. And we've had a group running there for since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and it is by far one of the most, or it is the most powerful thing I think that I could have ever, you know, I couldn't have even dreamed it up. Um, and it's so powerful to sit in a basement, right, of a state hospital and say to people, you know, we might be in the basement, but we're in solidarity with people, thousands of people, you know, groups, hundreds of groups all over the world. And so 
you know, we, when we think about the idea of community, we often think of it as one, one type of thing, but, you know, I've seen HVN, I've seen the power of bringing mutual support groups into places that others might say, no, that, that would be wrong. You know, it wouldn't fit our values. And um, so I just wanted to add on to that part about community. I, I know that, um, I know that, you know, I, that's all I'll say about that. So I hope that uh, was okay to add on. Yeah. 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 You know, Jeannie, maybe, um, maybe do you want to share more about, about what it's like wor working, working in, in, in the state hospital there? And, and I know we've chatted a little bit about that in preparing it, you know, and I think just one of the things I might highlight there. I mean, Ruth, you've really spoken to this broad range of the human experience and, and everyone is speaking to it. And sometimes there's this notion that, oh, well, there's the artists that are healthy and then there's the voice mm -hmm. hearers who are sick or <laughs> something like that. And, and I think this, um, one of the things that th your book and I think our, you know, people's experiences, right, our collective experiences really complicate this idea that that traditional psychiatry, you know, Benny's in the hospital and and there's um, there's medication, you know, but this isn't this isn't actually quite what helps him, you know. And mm -hmm. I wonder, um, it, you know, Jeannie, whether it's sharing more about your experiences working in the hospital or any, yeah, anything that comes to mind for folks in terms of um, uh, how how is the book and how are our how is the HVN complicating these ideas about mm -hmm. um, about psychiatry and voice hearers and 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 what healing looks like. I guess so. I, I sure it speaks directly about my own work, um, just for the you know sake of privacy for the people there. But I can speak, you know, I've been in many, many hospitals and I can speak, you know, as being a voice here in a hospital. I've gone through months in a hospital and had nobody ask me if I was hearing voices, but but all sort of react in the way as if I was scary and, you know, um, something to sort of be feared. Um, I think that one of the saddest things about going to a psychiatric hospital as a voice here is the fact that the people that are there to give you treatment are uncomfortable talking about voices. I think that's a, a really, um, and I think in some ways, Dr. Melanie in the book, you know, she, she, I have an image. I know exactly what she looks like because I've met her. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything more in case you never know who's on the call, but <laughs> um, but I, I could describe her curly I, I've given her curly hair. Um, so, um, but I think that that is, that is one of the things that separates those of us in hospitals that are there as the voice hearers and those of us who are, are there as the providers is that the people that hear the voices given the opportunity are very comfortable talking about their experiences. And, you know, that was what Marius <laughs> Rahm, the, he was a social yeah. psychiatrist, but he, he um, very different, right, than how people are traditionally yeah. thinking. But he put a group of voice hearers together after Patsy Hage, um, who was a voice here in the hospital he was working at, and um, they were meeting in his office. And she, you know, he was doing what he had been trained to do, like tell her your voices aren't real, ignore them, they're hallucinations. You know, and Patsy called him on it. She looked up at a cross on his wall and she said, you know, why do you get to believe? in a God that you can't see or hear, but I can't believe in these voices that I'm, he I'm hearing these voices. And I think, you know, that's probably um, one of the things I see as, as the most, um, you know, the easiest fixes would be for the people to, to get more comfortable. As for the group I facilitate, you know, we sometimes will have people bring their providers down as like, to kind of whip them into shape, like, wait a minute, there's like all this other stuff you don't know about my experiences. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you, you know, that, that I have more power um, than you think I do. Um, but there is just, a, there's nothing like, you know, sitting in a locked, <laughs> a locked hospital and being able to share, you know, about a voice that's telling you to do something scary, you know, and have a room sit there and support you and be curious and ask you questions and, you know, believe in your strength. Right. And that's not something that um, you can necessarily get anywhere else, especially in this 
day and age when we, as somebody mentioned in the chat, very quick to, you know, call the police on people and um, things like that. So that's, that's just, you know, I do know that when I was in hospitals, um, what looked like it had no meaning to other people had, you know, tremendous meaning to me and still does. Um, and all of those experiences that at the time made no sense are a part of who I am now. Um, and yeah, so. Was... I, I think you just mentioned something that's so important, um, which is curious. You know, that, that you're in a room with people who are listening to you and who, um, you know, who encourage you to be curious about your experience, right? Rather than fear it or try to sh automatically shut it down or, you know, suppress it through, you know, drugs or whatever. That, and, and what's interesting to me about that is um, it, it maps beautifully on the creative process. Um, very often as I'm, as I'm writing something, um, you know, I'll reach a point where the only way through, the only way to kind of solve this, solve whatever, whatever problem, story problem I've run into is to get, is to kind of widen out and get very, very curious about it. Right. And it's that widening and sort of softening and, um, you know, and willingness to be um, to be curious and, and, and ask questions and inquire rather than simply trying to find an answer right away. Right. Um, and shutting it down that it, it, it the two um, seem to uh, parallel each other in some sort of way. And um, and so. Anyway, just it just struck me uh, listening to that um, how inviting that is when somebody can listen to you um, with that attitude of real curiosity and deep, you know, deep listening, um, and and how we don't really we're not taught to even listen to ourselves that way, you know. Yeah, I mean that's that's really what's changed a lot of our yeah. lives though is the curiosity we have yeah. with our voices, right? Yeah like so one of the most simple things you can do, you know, if you're struggling with a voice that's like narrating your life or saying really awful things about you, or you start to yeah. wonder, is this true what this voice is saying? Yeah. Like, am I this, you know, whatever kind of person, but to just pause and to be curious and then to come back to choice and ask yourself, mm -hmm. is this true or isn't this true? And then just one simple word, yes, no, you know, and just that, that's, you know, what HVN does that's so different than um, the psychiatric system or even th most therapy, right, is, yeah. is to ask you, you know, or to ask your voices. We encourage people to talk not only about their voices, but to their voices, yeah. get to know them. How old do they sound? You know, ask your voices what their names are. Do they remind you of anyone? You know, um, why are they here? You know, what what's their pain? And so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I really love how you tied that into the creative process, I, I really am starting to get from, you know, hearing from you, they're just not, they're not separate, right? Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. um, the values that we carry and the, the yeah. values that those that are, um, you know, writing and, and other creative endeavors. Yeah. And, and spiritual endeavors too, I think, you know, because these are, these are the same kinds of um, attitudes that we try to cultivate in spiritual practice as well. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say a few words about my own experiences facilitating a support group um, since the end of 2014 at Yale New Haven Psychiatric Hospital. And as a private psychiatric hospital, the, um, the length of stay is, um, um, you know, average length of stay is nine days, which is challenging. And it's mostly exposure. But it, occasionally, um, when I've been lucky before COVID, um, I will see somebody for perhaps three or four weeks in a row. But almost uniformly, um, someone in the group um, will say things that they have never shared with anyone. 
um, any of the um, staff or clinicians um, simply because there is a sense of safety in knowing that I am a voice here and that I've, you know, that I have shared so openly. I also wanted to speak to the, um, you know, the clinicians and I kept silence for 26 years about my experiences. I was hospitalized from, um, with, let's see, from Halloween night, 1983 to uh, mid-February 1984, you know, with a three-week hiatus while I, when I signed out AMA and was waiting for a bed at Yale New Haven Hospital. But, and I had a career um, from 1984 until, uh, and until 2019. In 2010, I was sent to the organizational meetings of NAMI New Haven. And um, after, ha and I met so many people who were you know, really sharing their stories um, of um, so bravely that I've, th and, and also with, but su with such a sense of grief and loss and really believing in their diagnoses that I felt I needed to begin to speak out. When I began speaking out and when I was um, in the process of writing my memoir and was in it introduced by the wonderful Dr. Selby Jacobs, a psychiatrist, um, to a, 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 a clinician in New Haven with whom I'd had an excellent collegial relationship when Dr. Jacobs told this clinician that I was, you know, I was writing a voice, a memoir about being a voice here. She recoiled. It was like suddenly I had turned into someone else. I had turned into one of them. And it could, you know, it, it took... And it was, and I have had that happen often, which is infuriating. And I, I never really subscribed to my diagnosis. I simply, I complied to a degree, you know, weaned myself from my medications and carried on with my life until the next time. And each time I've taken medications only as needed and ultimately weaned myself. I know also that that can't be done by everyone. And I, 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 it is, um, but ultimately we are simply people and learning the stories, you know, about what happened and allowing us to find um, the ability to realize that others share our experiences mm -hmm. and to discern what happened and um, to find and to learn to stand up to our voices in whatever way is possible is really important. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, thinking of, oh, Claire, did you want to say more? No. Okay. I wanted um, to make another plug for the HVN USA because the the work that the uh, HVN is so important and you know I know in my groups you know I there is so much wonderful sharing um and ways the ways in which we give each other uh, ideas as to how to address of our voices and also some of the language some of the vocabulary that can allow other people to understand what's happening to them or to be able to speak about our experiences in ways that might be better accepted by um, those with the power to um, sorry, uh, to um, to influence their lives. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if we've said this explicitly, but there's online HVN groups, and then there's in-person ones, and and on the HVN website you can find find them. And, and of course, there's lots of other ways that people navigate too, like, a, you know, just sort of the, the pout, Ruth, you're sharing of like this book seeming, seemingly a way you've navigated your own experiences too, mm -hmm. you know. And I think one of the things we've, um, we've touched on here, and I think in our HVN groups is, is there are so many conversations about spirituality and, and people's spiritual experiences and both, um, these experiences that can be profoundly meaningful and, and also spiritual experiences that can be profoundly distressing. You know, I mean, some people hear, hear voices uh, of the devil or, 
or things like that. You know, I mean, it, it can, you know, there's a really wide range of spirituality, but I wonder, um, and maybe this will be the last question I'll ask. And then, and then as our conversation winds, we may, maybe we'll switch to the, to the Q and A just so we can get there. But um, I wonder, is there anything, um, of course it's in the book too, you know, and there's mm-hmm. this Buddhist mm-hmm. theme in the book, but yeah. w- what comes to mind for the three of you around um, these links between spirituality, synchronicity, our voices and visions and, and this, this really, um, this terrain. Is there anything, yeah, anything folks want to say? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, uh, there are Buddhist themes throughout the book. I mean, in, in a way, um, I, I would call it a Buddha, I would call it a Buddhist book. Uh, the title, for example, is a you know comes from a, um, a Mahayana Buddhist sutra called the um, the uh, the Heart Sutra or the Heart of Great Wisdom Sutra. Um, the you know this this um, one of the things that I was thinking about is a, a Japanese Zen, or it's actually Chinese Zen parable, koan, it's called, um, which asks a question, do insentient beings speak the Dharma, right? In other words, can insentient beings uh, speak and can they teach us about reality, right? Can insentient beings like, you know, like, you know, a a rock or a pebble or a mountain or a river or your running shoe or a pencil or a Christmas ornament, you know, can they, can they teach us? Can they be our teachers? Right. And, um, you know, the, the answer in Zen is yes, of course, but, um, but, you know, the idea is to sit with this and to really ponder the nature of our interconnectedness with the world around us, the world, the material world around us. Um, and, and so this is a very important uh, teaching that sort of runs through the book um, as Benny struggles with, um, you know, his relationship with objects and the voices that he's hearing. And Annabelle also struggles with her relationship with objects and her, the enormous amount of desire that she feels and the, the, affect the emotion that she feels towards her things, uh, which is something that I uh, understand and, and I feel that as well, um, that, you know, for the, for the things around me. The other thing too is that in uh, Japanese, uh, the indigenous Japanese religion, Shintoism, um, in Shinto tradition, th- things, right, have spirits, right? And, um, and so this is just part of it really is part of Japanese culture, and I think it's one of the reasons why uh, Japanese anime is as popular as it is and as advanced as it is, because this idea of animating you know, the inanimate is something that is rooted deeply, deeply, deeply in Japanese culture. Um, and, and so these kinds of themes uh, play through the, the book as well. Um, but the, you know, the, the main, I think, um, the um, sort of the, the main theme, as it were, is this, is this theme of interconnectedness, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh uh, spoke of it. And that's what Benny discovers is that, you know, he and Annabelle are not alone, you know, that they have this, you know, they have peers, they have people, uh, you know, he has the Aleph and he has the bottle man and um, their peer support group that's starting to come together. Um, and Melanie, Dr. Melanie is, is, you know, also connected in this. And, um, and, and this is really what, uh, you know, what saves him um, that you can't operate. It's impossible to, op- it's unrealistic to operate alone, right? Simply because it's unrealistic to think of ourselves as isolated, separate individuals. Um, and the title, Form and Emptiness, um, is, is very much about this. You know, the, the word emptiness is a misleading translation uh, because it, it sounds so empty, right? And, and emptiness doesn't really, you can also translate emptiness as kind of boundlessness. Um, things that are not form are empty, right? And uh, the way that I kind of like to think about it just as a metaphor is um, to imagine emptiness as this vast ocean, right? Um, So vast that you can't see the horizon, you can't see where the sky meets the ocean. It's just emptiness as far as you can see. And, um, you know, in the middle of this ocean, you know, the, the, 
uh, the planet, you know, the planet shifts and the winds blow and the moon waxes and wanes and out of this ocean of emptiness, a little wave, you know, starts to form. And, um, and the wave kind of looks up and, you know, looks around and he's got a little white hat on his head and, um, you know, and he, he looks around and he thinks, wow, look at me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm really something, I'm a wave, I've got form, you know, I'm taller than, I'm taller than all of this emptiness around me, right? I'm, I'm really something, I'm really something. Um, and for a while that seems great, right? But then, you know, the planet turns and the moon ebbs and the winds subside and suddenly the little wave is, you know, going back down and is part of the ocean again, right? And, and the wave doesn't like this, right? The wave liked being a self, Right. The wave liked being a form. Um, and so, of course, the, you know, the the wave can't exist without the ocean. The ocean can't exist without the wave. They are completely, you know, interconnected. They inter are. And um, and it also points out the, you know, the, the truth of impermanence. Right. Nothing lasts. Right. Including us, including waves, right? including Benny's father. Um, and so this, this theme of, you know, on one hand, impermanence, but on the other hand, radical interconnectedness, which means that, you know, that, that we just, we just are shifting forms, you know, um, we're one thing and then we're something else. Um, and, and these are the, you know, I think these are the kinds of truths that are, or the kinds of, you know, philosophies or thoughts that are running through the book. Um, and that are tied very much into um, my Buddhist, my Buddhist practice. I, I would like, um, I had a thought about form and emptiness that mm. is precisely um, as you've described it, Ruth, and um, I was thinking that when adherence to form, you know, hold the little wave, you know, yes. proud to, um, to have the little white crest cap um, on its head, you know, holding on to that. And when we, uh, you know, adherence to form mm -hmm. can ultimately be empty, particularly if the form is dictated by others mm. or, or by society itself. And we come to believe that, you know, being a little crest you know, in the vast ocean is so much better than the rest. And when right. things do change and, and there is, you know, once again, that vastness and one's lost, then what does one do? And, and, and really, um, and, and I love, you know, I truly love the idea of interbeing and yeah. intersubjectivity and the ways in which we, um, when we really honor and respect other people mm. and also understand our interrelationship with mm. um, the natural world, mm. you know, both um, inanimate, um, you know, the, you know, I can feel the energies of great, um, mm -hmm. great rocks and great trees. Yeah. Yes. So um, one has to listen and feel much more deeply, uh, much more closely to feel other, you know, yeah. other um parts of aspects of the natural world but i wonder there's a question in there somewhere and forgive me for <laughs> my ineptitude at asking no, no, no. proper questions but it, it would be lovely if you um could respond to that yeah no i think you're absolutely right i i, I you know i i think you're absolutely right and um you know, we, we do become very attached to having form, you know, and, um, and it's that attachment that's really the problem. That's what causes the pain and the suffering. Um, and, you know, nothing is, you know, nothing is permanent, nothing is unchangeable. And that goes for, you know, identities too. I mean, you know, the wave has this identity as being a wave, right? And he, the wave is just very attached to that story of being a wave, right? And we all get like that, right? We all get very attached to certain identities that are either, you know, either that we've developed or that have been foisted upon us, you know? Um, and, and uh, you know, when, when, we, when we cling to, 
tightly to those identities, um, which of course are always changing, right? Identities are, are always changing. I mean, I'm a different person, Claire, when I'm sitting here talking to you, you know, than I am when I'm, you know, talking to my students, for example, right? Um, and, and so my identity, my identity shifts accordingly, right? It mirrors and, and, and that's, you know, this, this too parallels, I think, what happens in reading, you know, my, my idea about, you know, the book that you and I co-create is going to be different from the book that Derek and I co-create and the book that Jeannie and I co-create, right? So, um, and I think identity is very much like that too. So it's empty of any kind of fixed, not unchanging, you know, uh, self, but right. And the beauty of a great book is that we can all resonate to it so deeply. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah I, I found the impermanence for me, I'm not Buddhist, but I find it to be one of the most difficult things in my life <laughs> is ever to this day. Um, I get attached no to lots of, yeah. but I find it's not just identity. I think that especially as a voice hair like it's the emotion like behind mm -hmm. your voices behind you know the stories you tell yourself about your life um it's hard to um make peace with you know being the ocean and the wave that are always <laughs> kind of ebbing and flowing um as much as I do love the ocean um and I think that you know one of the um well, that's, that's kind of all I'll say about that. I do, I do think though, touching on spirituality in general is really important. You know, we had, um, we had P Peter Bolomore at the hospital where I work. Um, he's a leader in the hearing voices movement, internationally known, really wonderful human being. And we did an HBN group and in it, he brought up, um, when he worked with an Aboriginal tribe in Australia, um, and their kind of spiritual outlook on voices and how it, differs from um, especially American culture, mm -hmm. but when somebody is hearing voices and it's a very you know spiritual outlook, but when somebody is hearing voices in this tribe, instead of saying, what's wrong with you? You know, like, what did you do to cause this? All of the, the community, they get together and they ask themselves, how do we contribute to this person's distress? How did we, you know, contribute to this person's, you know, massive, you know, change, life change. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, trauma is such an important way, right, that we understand voices, but spirituality is also such mm. a powerful way that people not only understand their voices, but learn to live with them. I know for myself, I um, went through an experience where I thought like my voices told me I was Mary Magdalene. It was such a beautiful experience, mm. even though horrible things, you know, on the surface were happening to me. Um, and when I sort of got to the tail end of that, I still didn't know I was really hearing voices. And I had this experience where I was in a program and I was sitting in a group and, you know, I was totally in my own world. I had this old pea coat, this purple pea coat on, and I was rocking back and forth, just subtly listening, but not really listening. And, you know, I had never thought of myself as hearing voices everybody, you know, Jesus, everybody was hearing, I was hearing. Um, and there was this person in the group talking about like her voices and alligators in the bathtub. And, you know, and I do believe it was a very spiritual experience. Like I mm. stood up out of nowhere. And I said, that's me. I'm hearing voices. Like that's me. And it was such a earth shattering experience for me. And a lot of people have heard this story from you, but telling it never gets, you know, smaller. And you think like, how could something like that happen without divine intervention? How could you suddenly shift your whole outlook after months and months in a, you know, a program where you had never once thought that. So mm -hmm. I think spirituality and voice hearing comes from so many different um, places. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I will be doing some more reading on impermanence. So <laughs> hopefully get that together so that was all I wanted to say Thanks. the other thing in um in Buddhism is there's this teaching that you can't become enlightened by yourself you know um that that the only way to become enlightened and liberated is with someone else 
right? And so the teaching is only a Buddha and a Buddha, right? Only a Buddha and a Buddha can enlighten each other, can liberate each other. And that is, I think, it, it seems like that's something that could come right out of hearing voices, right? It, it's it's this I, the importance of community and sangha, you know, of, of a community of practitioners, a community of um, people who are engaged in in this work of life of liberation. And and it seems that letting go of preconceptions and of who we must be mm -hmm. or need to be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is you know the very beginning and you know um, and the whole notion of grasping and holding on to mm -hmm. something, you know, whatever belief it is that we believe, we feel we must hold on to in order to exist in mm -hmm. the world that, in which we find ourselves. Yeah. And, and it's so difficult. You know, life is people, life is cruel and people can be incredibly cruel, but they can mm -hmm. also be just incredibly kind. Mm -hmm. And and when, um, and the goal of the Hearing Voices Network and of ISPS US, I shouldn't um, give a short shift to ISPS, um, the, um, the perspectives that we share in terms of looking for um, psychological and social understandings to the array of experiences that are, you know, given the diagnosis of, you know, um, if, well, mm -hmm. associated with psychosis mm -hmm. um, is really challenging, and you know your own creative process. Were you to um, were you to have spoken of it in another way, or you know had it been heard differently? Um, yeah, I I I sincerely. I sincerely believe that the creative process is very akin to psychosis, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to that which is uh, given the label mm -hmm. of psychosis. And um, there's so much mystery. There's so much that we don't understand. Uh, and you see, I will, forgive me, I'm... Yeah. Um, you articulate it far better than yeah. I. No, no. Do you know this book? Um, it's no, by Robert Oxnam. It's called A Fractured Mind. Um, and Robert Oxnam um, was diagnosed with multiple, uh, you know, multiple personality disorder, um, dissociative identity disorder, but he prefers the earlier, you know, um, uh, language to describe it. And, um, and the book is written um, from the points of view of his different um, selves, right? Of his different people, um, his different personalities. And he and I have had some fascinating conversations about exactly this, you know, about um, the, you know, the, the way that, you know, the, the differences and the similarities between dissociative identity disorder and the creative process, right? Um, because he's also an artist and and does a lot of things as well. So it, it's it is fascinating, you know. And and there's a a real sense of kinship there um, that that he and I have explored in in conversation. Um, it's I'm, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. This isn't the time for it, but I'm curious about dissociation because I wonder if it's necessarily dissociation or just simply the fact that we, at various times, I have been in tuned and you have spoken to the need to really listen closely mm -hmm. to what exists in, in the universe, in the mm -hmm. ether. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of us are attuned at certain times mm -hmm. and others through cultivation and the ability to organize mm -hmm. are able simply to hear, to listen closely and continue to continue to hear and not be undone mm -hmm. by the array of experiences that we all uh, array of whatever phenomena that we all receive and either pay attention to or able to manage whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you, thank you, Claire, and and um, no, that's wonderful. And there's there's a there's a question in in the chat about this actually, which maybe we can. I I do want to give us some time to address some of the questions in the chat, and um, we will. You know, it, it's right about 
um, 4.30, 7.30 on the East Coast, some other time in some other place, depending on where you are. Um, and and we, we can stretch a little bit of time here because I do really, you know, we want to really um, address some of the questions in the Q&A and there's some really lovely ones in here and, and we won't get to all of them, um, but we'll give a few. And if folks need to leave, you're, you know, do do what you need to do. The 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 webinar will also be uploaded online afterwards. So if you if you miss a few minutes and want to tune in later, or maybe you're in the future now, welcome tuning in, uh, you know, to the to the people on YouTube or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, so what, a couple of a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, Someone has asked, uh, Jim has asked, um, Jeannie mentioned trauma and hearing voices. What helps you with the trauma? And then he's listed some of the embodied healing modalities. And, and, um, and someone named Josh has asked, um, I, I love the excerpt about learning to listen to our surroundings. I'm really interested in synesthesia, like mm -hmm. hearing colors and smelling sights. Do you have any exercises or tips to learn how to experience and interpret the in, interpret the communication that's all around us? So, um, Claire, maybe that's a little tight. And those are two separate questions. One maybe is the external and the internal. But uh, I think folks are asking for some tips and ways that people that you all have learned to navigate um, these terrains. If there's anyone, any anything anyone would like to share. I have to confess that um, I am only, I've spent most of my life trying to block myself, trying to protect myself from the ways in which I experience the world because um, uh, I, uh, I have been very, very sensitive and vulnerable to various inputs, you know, um, and certainly people, um, there have been times when if I am open and accepting, you know, I enter a space and I'm opening, open and accepting of everyone, I can meet someone and not even be able to say my name properly until I throw up a wall. And so as I, um, mm -hmm. and so I am working very, um, very slowly, but in very intentionally to try to open myself up to that so that I can listen better, so that I can feel more deeply and not be so blocked. But, but there have been my at periods of active voice hearing, um, extended periods of, you know, over a year um, have, you know, it, it's simply something opened up and I was barraged by experiences. And my second extended period, 89 to 92, um, allowed me to essentially refine my essential self from someone who is very shut down and in order to feel nothing to become the person that um, a little bit more organized than I am this evening because I'm taking some medications following my cataract surgery. But um, I, um, I have been able to live a reasonably full life. But in terms of the kind of listening more deeply, I think that Ruth can speak to that. I am through meditation beginning to open myself up. My partner is, you know, um, talking to me a lot about ways in which I can be more intentional about opening myself up to hearing everything that that I might be able to hear without being undone and you know, sort of losing losing myself in that process. And I'll stop there and you know, if Jeannie or or Ruth or Jeannie um, could, or, or you, Derek, could speak to that. That would be terrific. Well, since you um, since you brought up the subject of meditation, I'll, I'll just uh, pick up on that briefly. Um, for me, meditation has been uh, perhaps the singular practice that has allowed me to uh, to be curious. You know, to sit still and to be curious and to um, open rather than closing, rather than shutting down. And um, I know that it's been tremendously helpful uh, in, my, in my creative work, um, just staying open to story and letting story uh, reveal itself, sort of following following the story, the characters where they want to go. Um, but 
there's a parallel there, of course, between um, between uh, life and and art, you know. And the uh, the practice of meditation has also been um, extremely helpful helpful for me, um, just in terms of sitting with distressing emotions, um, sitting with dark emotions, uh, sitting with, um, you know, really frightening states of mind. Um, and again, understanding that, uh, you know, and it, and it takes practice, I think, to do this. This is why they call meditation a practice, because you have to practice it a lot, you know, in order to, um, uh, to, sort of be able to derive any of these benefits, but the idea of just simply being able to sit with this, you know, with extreme discomfort um, and not shut down uh, in the face of that. Um, you know, I've also uh, over my life, you know, after, after I got out of the psych ward, um, I just started self-medicating. I, I, just drank for about 20 years <laughs> and um, you know, and that was my way of you know, of staying closed, you know, staying shut down. Um, and it was really when I started meditating that I was able to, you know, relax and let go of that coping strategy, which of course is not a sustainable coping strategy and, um, and was able to uh, just, um, I think, tolerate the, the painful emotions. Um, so that's, you know, that's the practice that's worked, uh, worked best for me. Um, and, and of course, part of that is um, being in community, being in, in Sangha, um, because, you know, it's much easier to meditate in a group than it is by yourself. <laughs> I've been engaged in an American Buddhist, um, um, Zen Buddhist meditation practice for about five years. I'm very bad at it, but I'm <laughs> Good, good. Yeah, I think a lot of people that, um, especially if you're in the mental health system, and many people have heard me talk about this, um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when dialectical behavioral therapy came out and Marshall Linehan became the absolute authority on mindfulness and meditation and ripped off Buddhism and made lots and lots of money. Um, but that is, I'll lower my anger level. But if you were in the mental health system and you were being forced, right, to go in a group and forced to meditate for whatever, or poor Thich Nhat Hanh and his raisin meditation was being thrust upon you, or you wouldn't go out for your cigarette break or whatever it is, meditation, like for those of us that were in the system then, like for me, I have a really hard time making peace with it. It's even sure. you guys have voice here is challenging for me to meditate. Like sometimes I, I do like, I'll put on ASMR ambiance, like fire sounds and things to help ground me. I have, um, from also being told for so many years, yoga would change my life. I've now only the last few years been able to really, you know, incorporate yoga as more of like a moving meditation. I collect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sea glass. That's a really big meditation. It has a really big connection to my recovery from being, you know, overwhelmed with distressing voices. But I do think it's so important to remember what the mental health system has done to taint meditation mm -hmm. for a lot of us, because here I am, I don't know, 12 years out <laughs> and I still get frustrated. I was reading poor Techno. I feel so badly, you know, for him because I was reading one of his books being peace recently. It was an excellent book, but I was thinking like, I I'm just so upset that this, this was like, you know, I spent three and a half years in a day treatment and, you know, reading like things from Marsha about, um, you know, walking meditations and read, and, and it just took away kind of the soul of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have someone that's very much a mentor to me that is a Buddhist. So I do keep, <laughs> I keep that as kind of my measure for that. Like, you know, there is real Buddhism <laughs> and there is real, you know, Zen people, um, because it's something I personally wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for trauma, you know, someone mentioned like healing from trauma. I think this is where peer support, right? Intentional peer support, which is one model, um, but really just heart to heart peer support, like learning to have a healthy relationship again, learning to have connections that don't also come with 
really horrible, you know, add-ons like abuse or, or neglect or, you know, um, if you don't do this, I won't love you anymore. Um, that has been probably the most powerful thing for me in my life. And it's an ever kind of um, growing thing. I think, you know, finding ways to learn to make choices in your life. You know, I can remember being in day treatment and realizing I had just sort of woken up. Like I didn't, I was in art therapy. We were doing these like beautiful altered art books and they were like, pick your favorite color, you know, like of this material. And I was like, I don't even have a favorite color. Like I don't have anything anymore. Like, and so just those choices you can make, you know, I mean, that's kind of like the most fundamental um, trauma, you know, healing way to, you know, strategy. So that that's just a little from my own life, but I hope Ruth, I hope that wasn't offensive about. Not at all. Not at all. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you brought it up actually, because there's a real um, there there's what you're saying is absolutely true. First of all, you, you know, you, you can't force meditation down, you know, down somebody's throat. It's just not going to work. Right. I mean, it has to be coming from the person. The person has to want to do it. Right. Um, So it's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, to, to require it is, is already just counterproductive, but the point you make too about, um, you know, about meditation not being possible for, or not being the, you know, wise, um, not being skillful for somebody who, um, you know, has, uh, you know, who's actively hearing voices, um, who has, uh, you know, deep trauma that, that, um, you know, is, is uh, causing, you know, significant distress. This is, this is, very, very important to bring up. And there's a new school of um, uh, researchers and people involved in the mindfulness community um, who are who are trying to understand and how better to, you know, how, how to um, teach meditation in a more trauma sensitive way. Um, and so there's a, a man named um, a, Scott, a guy named David Trelevin. Um, and he's he's got a lot of, uh, I think he's got a website, um, but it's all about um, trauma sensitive, trauma informed meditation. Um, and, and so I think this is really, really important. Um, we can't assume that, you know, that one uh, treatment is going to work for everybody. It's not, you know, every, everybody's going to have their, uh, you know, a different need here. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. I think that that's super important. What was his name again? The- his name is David Trelevin, Trelevin, T-R-E-L-E-A-V-E-N. Okay. And if you, if you Google uh, trauma-informed meditation or trauma-sensitive meditation, um, he comes right up. Great, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ruth. And yeah, thanks for, for naming that, Jeannie. And it's, it's interesting, you know, just I'll say for myself, it's interesting as I'm sort of the opposite. Meditation was always incredibly helpful, but I had to hide it from the meditation centers where I was, where I was practicing. And um, because I knew I wouldn't be welcome if, if I told them openly about my experiences and, and Claire, when you shared about after you shared at the NAMI experience, I, I had the same experience of being a part of a Buddhist community for actually I'd grown up there, but had been there for many, many years. I knew these people so well. And and as time went on, I said, I can tell these people about my experiences. And, and I was wrong. You know, they said, oh, oh, if you if you if you've been in the hospital, you're not welcome here anymore. You know, you can't you can't. So so, I, you know, it's sort of both, it goes both ways. Sometimes these things are not helpful. And other times, you know, so so hopefully we mm-hmm. can continue this conversation about about meditation and Buddhism, because it's mm-hmm. obviously there's so much um, terrain that is so fruitful. And there's there's so many nuances, too. Yeah. Um, and, it, but I'm, yeah, I'm really appreciating that thread in, in this conversation myself. Um, uh, you know, so we've got, maybe we'll do, um, one or two more questions. Um, and you know, there's, there's been a number of questions in the chat about the process of writing. And I think people mm-hmm. are, um, you know, and, I, uh, and Claire, I know you're a writer and, um, and Ruth, of course, and, 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 and Jeannie, maybe there's something just of sharing your story that if, if that fits more than, than writing, I don't. But um, but uh, a question here from uh, Leah Harris is, um, thank you for this incredible program. Uh, what have been your strategies and challenges with depicting experiences of voices and visions on the page? Claire, do you wanna? Um, I, 
I can respond. Yeah. Um, I would write a different book now where, um, mm. if I had given the opportunity, I, um, and particularly after listening to Ruth describe her own process of really um, sort of feeling, you know, really paying attention to the, the, um, the physical, the uh, physiological, um, uh, you know, so the somatic experience, you know, I simply sort of wrote what happened and didn't go into, um, for the most part, I think, did not go as deeply as Ruth did in, into, you know, what it felt like. I would describe what happened to me, but less, you know, the, the knot in my stomach, mm -hmm. the ways in which, you know, my mind, um, I would completely lose focus and be a, be unable to, you know, do whatever. Um, but, you know, in terms of my own writing process, I got up every morning before work at quarter of six, wrote for 45 minutes to an hour, and then um, would get ready to go to work and work a full day. Um, and that took place over a number of years. I uh, the notes that I had made during my, um, I kept a notebook when, during my hospitalizations in 83, 84, and also wrote about 20 pages that described what I was thinking and feeling um, and, and the people uh, in my life who were um, figured in my various experiences. I... Um, I don't, I, I don't know that I'm being very useful, but I can think about my process and um, write it and ask Leah to send it to members of this list. I think that would be very useful for me um, to, in terms of describing my experience. But basically, I would just sit down and write. And the process of writing is a wonderful spiritual practice and remembering. And as I um, wrote and remembered more, I would really, one thing would lead to another and I would remember more. I would remember a feeling. I would remember a conversation. I would um, I would ask my family and was told by, my, you know, when my sister told me that um, during my, uh, I think my second um, extended departure from shared experience, um, when I was terrified that I was going to be um, attacked when my went, went with my family into Boston and my voices suggested to me that if I borrowed my sister's clothes and used her makeup no one would recognize me um, and I don't um, I don't know how useful I'm being at this point about speaking about the process of writing but just writing helps mm -hmm. and really remembering and reflecting and as you engage in it you will reawaken those memories mm -hmm. and and as you continue you will be able to uh, I think yes awakening those memories and really getting in touch with the feeling the tears the laughter the animosities with various people and then beginning to write to that you know um, it takes it is a process it is a discipline but it is incredibly rewarding mm -hmm. and I'm going to stop there yeah yeah no, I would, I would agree. Um, I would very much agree with that. And, um, you know, the, the more you write, the easier it gets in a way, because you, um, you know, just the process of, I mean, you know, uh, I, I write morning pages, you know, I, I still do that where I just, I sit down in the morning and just write for, you know, three pages, just keep my hand moving, just to kind of get things moving, get language moving again. Um, and, um, and so that's, you know, that's really helpful. In terms of writing the voices themselves, um, th I knew that there were going to be different kinds of voices that I was going to need to in some way um, evoke, but I also didn't want to evoke them in a way that was too literal. Um, because the voices didn't seem, I mean, some of Benny's voices are very literal and some of them are just giving him a hard time and telling him, you know, telling him to do stuff. And, um, and so those voices were easier to put down 
uh, in, in dialogue and they were intrusive. And so they would, you know, they, he would be trying to say something and then a voice would interrupt. And so then there was a, you know, an interesting, um, uh, you know, an interesting problem of how to represent that on the page, how to inter how to represent on the page an intrusive thought that cuts into, you know, a sentence, for example. And that just took a lot of, you know, really, because you need to be able to write it in a way that the reader is can also follow what's going on. Um, but also, you know, and, and you don't want to stress the reader out so much that the reader can't follow, right? And, and you've just lost them. So that just took a lot of, you know, very, very careful line work and editing work to make, um, to make the, you know, the, the rhythms of those passages, um, you know, sort of uh, come alive. Um, but then there were other passages too, where um, what was being, what I was trying to evoke was a, a slightly different quality of sound. Um, and there's this little passage um, uh, where here, which I'll just read. Um, Benny has just written a story. He's written his, a, a story about a table leg and, and what the table leg said to him. And, um, and he's, he's saying, uh, and, and he's talking to the bottle man about this. Um, and he says, uh, the bottle man asks, uh, the bottle man asked if I really heard the leg saying all the words that I wrote down on the page. And I told him it wasn't like that. I mean, it's not like I was just making random shit up, but it also, I also didn't hear the words the way you hear words when a person is talking. It's more like trying to write down the kinds of feelings you feel with your body and then remember later on. Like when you hurt yourself and later you remember the pain, but the memory of the pain is different from the actual pain, right? That's the kind of voices that things have and the stories they tell are more like memories or dreams. You know how a dream can be totally real seeming, but when you try to put it into words, it kind of dissolves and melts away. That's what happens to the dream stories of things. Their feeling voices are impossible to put into words. And as soon as you try, the story starts to evaporate, which is why what I wrote down came out so shitty. Um, I told the bottle man all this and he said poetry was like that too, like breezes or winds in the mind. At first you might not feel much, not whole words or sentences, but more like currents of air moving across an open wound. You have to keep your mind open and try to feel the voice of the poem as it blows by, even if it hurts a little. He said the trick is not to grab at the wind because as soon as you do, it won't be there. He showed me with his hand. He opened it and uh, he opened it and said to pretend it was my mind. And then he closed his eyes. He said, I should hold very still and keep the hand of my mind open and let the voices come to me. He sat there for a long time with his eyes closed and his palm open like he was expecting a poem to drop from the sky. Right. And, and so that is a kind of description of a different kind of, well, it, it, it's kind of to answer the question, how do you write about voices? It, it, the bottle man is, is, you know, is, is giving an instruction right there about how to listen for the voices of poems, you know, and how to listen to the voices of characters and how to listen to the voices of, you know, of, of, stories, right? Um, with that kind of relaxed, open mind. So. I, I think for me, that that's so beautiful in listening to your characters' voices, you know, that that process mm. is fascinating. For me, writing about my voices was much easier because I, I wrote about the things that they said to me. Mm -hmm and the ways in which I felt, you know, the fear that I felt or the elation if they were incredibly flattering and then the doubt and dismissiveness when they were overly flattering. Mm -hmm. um, I, you would have written much more beautifully about <laughs> those yeah, particular yeah. voices. I might write more beautifully now <laughs> uh, knowing um, what I, um, 
I was a better writer at the end of my memoir than I was when I started. Um, and that and that process is rewarding in and of itself. So just writing. And I would like to put a plug, and we're very behind, but the HVN USA board is in the process of um, resurrecting the, um, the book project, which began oh, yeah. uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And when, then we got completely, we all got very overwhelmed. Um, but we are going to put out another call for submissions for um, prose, poetry, art, and music. And we've gotten a couple of gorgeous songs. We'd love to have more songs, more of everything. But um, if you all, um, our voice here is um, please, and writer and artists of any sort, please do submit something. Thank, thank you, Claire, and um, and and Ruth for sharing, and and uh, maybe just a final a final question here. You know, we've got it's it's hard to to pick questions. There's so many lovely ones here here in the chat, and um, there's there's a lot of questions about the book and different characters, and um, there's a. Uh, Bill, Bill has put in some, some really, there's a really poetic question about sort of the nature of Zoom, um, mm. Zoom meetings. And um, <laughs> I actually see one, uh, I see one from my mom in there, you know, there's lots of, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> hi mom. Um, mm. do, uh, but I think maybe we'll end with this, we could end with this question from Yulia. Um, it says, do you know, do you know about the new care court system in, in California? Um, and if yes, do you participate or plan to participate in the fight against it? And then more generally, just are there other forms of, of activism or political action that, that people are involved in? And I, I can speak to the care court part just a little bit as the West Coaster on, on the call here. Um, I'll, I'll say I'm deeply, deeply troubled by care court. Uh, you know, it's a new mm -hmm. rewriting of who and how people enter into mandated um, uh, mental health court that's being billed as a solution to homelessness, um, despite uh, uh, without creating any housing, you know, I mean, it, it's really quite disturbing. And um, I'm about 20 minutes from the California border. So I've been peripherally involved in, in some of the fight against it. Um, and you know, worked a little bit with organizations like Madness Network News and Camp Pro and um, Western Regional Advocacy Project, you know, there's a lot of really good folks involved in that fight. And, and I think it is something we should be thinking about, we've fought for our rights. Um, we, we, we have to keep fighting for our rights. You know, some of the rights we won in the 60s and 70s uh, look like they're being eroded in California right now. And so it, it, it's quite disturbing. Um, and we have a long legacy of fighting and, and we, you know, people that hear voices and have visions, we've always, um, uh, we, you know, I think now is also a really good time for working together and doing this. Um, so that's just my little care court part there. But um, Jeannie, maybe do you want to start us off with answering this question? Just it could be about care court or just more generally, um, any any forms of activism or political action that you are involved in or, or you know, you know, want to encourage? Um, so that that's a great question. I was wondering if at some point I could ask Ruth a question before we close. But um, I think probably there might be other people that could answer that question better than me. Um, but I did have one final question for Ruth, just based on something she said earlier and kind of the pivot towards the writing part. Um, I just a burning question. So if it's okay to ask that after. Be great. Totally. Yeah, totally. If, if, if everyone has time. Um, Ruth, you mentioned yeah. when you were talking about voices and you were talking about, you know, the inner voices that, you know, really kind of drive you wild when you're trying to write, telling you you're being selfish or you're not, you know, you're not a good writer and things like that. So I was wondering, maybe there's people similar to me. So I am a writer. I don't share my writing very, very often and almost at all. Um, you know, at one time writing sort of saved my life growing yeah. up, I would write about this girl and she would always be in these different places and like the house would basically be burning down outside the room while I was doing my writing. That's great. Um, That's great. <laughs> but this girl would be anywhere but Gloucester. Um, and, um, you know, and, and writing continued to be a big part of my life. And then when I was actually in that same day treatment with that same yeah. art therapist, I wrote this, what I thought, and I still have it, this story. Um, 
And it was really the story about my voices and Mary Magdalene. Mm. And I was trying yeah. to make sense. And I, it was a journaling group and I was so scared to read it out loud and I yeah. read it. And then, you know, that nervousness, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I hope that was okay. Was that too long? Expecting her to say, no, Jeannie, you did a good job. And she said, Jeannie, she said, yes, it was too long. And that's because of your illness. You can't edit yourself. You're incapable of editing yourself. And I'm not kidding. Since then, like I, I did share my writing once on Madden America. There's certain people in my life who see it, but I'm wondering how oh. as a writer, how you surpass like I'm those. so sorry. Well, yeah, and I wasn't, I promised I wasn't saying that for sympathy. I know I'm I, interested how you trust yourself to share your writing when yeah. you have those inner voices saying you suck or you're not good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I am just so angry on your behalf right now <laughs> that that somebody would have shut you down like that. Um, you know, uh, it, that's that's outrageous. It really is. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, you know, when we're just starting to write, none of us can edit, you know? I mean, nobody, I, this is something I had to learn. Um, my first manuscript I turned in, you know, was like, I don't know, maybe it was the second, but anyway, one of the manuscript I turned in was like 900 pages. <laughs> um, and it was 900 pages and my, and it was about potato. It was about a family of potato farmers. And I just got totally into like potato breeding and like, you know, and with just every last detail, right? And my editor, who's very kind, um, she said, you know, Ruth, your readers don't need to know everything there is about potato breeding, right? And I ended up cutting out about 300 pages. So the, the, that's our natural tendency is to, is to, some of us overwrite, I overwrite, you probably overwrite, but that's fine. That's just the way, that's the way you write. And then, you know, at some point, if, if you're serious about it, you go through an editorial process and you learn to, you know, you learn to trim and you learn to edit and stuff, but it's a skill that, that you have to, you have to acquire. Nobody's, you know, uh, you can't, you can't, and it, it's helpful to have somebody else to do it. That's why they have editors. Right. <laughs> um, so anyway, all of that to say that, um, you know, I, uh, it was, I think over the years, I found gr small groups of sympathetic people who would help me, you know, again, it's the same thing, right? You, you need, you need community, right? And I found, I found um, a group of writers and readers who would um, be willing to read and be kind and gentle and say, you know, okay, this part, it's not working so well, you know, but this part's okay, this part's great, you know, whatever. And, and little by little with that kind of support, um, I, I overcame my fear, you know, um, of, of putting it out. But even so, I remember the first book that I put out into the world, I was, I made myself sick. Like I literally was sick with remorse and regret and terror thinking that, oh my God, now everyone is going to, you know, because fiction is like looking inside your mind, right? It's like taking off your mental clothes and, and everybody, I just thought everybody is going to see what I see, how crazy I am or whatever. Um, it, it just, you know, it, it, like anything else, it takes time. It's like swimming, you know, or, or jumping into the deep end, you know, you, you do it little by little. But if you've had uh, an experience like you've had, where somebody really shut you down in a very public and, and you know, humiliating way, uh, you know, you need to, you know, you really need to find a community of, you know, readers who can support you through that because you need to get over, you know, you need to <laughs> heal, heal that wound, you know, that that's, that's, you know, that's really hard. And so many people, um, you know, their teachers, their elementary school teachers or whatever, you know, have dealt that kind of blow and it's, it's tough. So that was really helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Find people you love and, you know, exchange, exchange writing with them. Well, 
any anything else the the three of you want want to say sort of in in ending before we let folks go yeah ruth i just want to shout out to some of the people who really helped me um and uh one of them is annie rogers who uh derek i think you know annie right uh, she's a um, she's a Lacanian psychoanalyst and a voice hearer and a beautiful writer. And the three books that I read of hers that I loved um, was *A Shining Affliction*, *The Story of Harm and Healing in Psychotherapy*, um, *Incandescent Alphabets: Psychosis and the Enigma of Language*, and *The Unsayable: The Hidden Language of Trauma*. And these are, they're just beautiful, beautiful books. And so the person who asked earlier about, you know, how to write voices, I think Annie Rogers does a spec, I mean, she's a poet and she just does a beautiful, beautiful job with that. Um, Gail Hornstein, you, you mentioned already, um, Agnes's Jacket. Um, a psychologist search for the meaning of madness is a, is a wonderful, um, wonderful book. And, um, and all of Gail's work on first person narratives of madness, uh, it, it just really great. Um, another person is uh, Sa Sasha Altman de Bruhl, who was one of the co-founders of uh, the Icarus Project, which is now the Fireweed Collective, and um, it, which is a network of peer support uh, groups. And um, Sasha is, a, again, a beautiful writer, but he had this one book that he wrote early on. Um, here it is. Um, Maps to the Other Side, right? The Adventures of a Bipolar Cartographer. And it's, a, um, it's, a, it's kind of a zine. It's, no, it's not a zine so much. It's, there's some pictures in it. Um, and then the, the last person I just want to mention is Allison Smith. And Allison wrote a beautiful memoir called Name All the Animals. And she's in the process now of writing a book called The Echo, um, Hearing Voices, Talking Back and Confronting the Mysteries of Consciousness. And I've seen uh, proposals for the book and, um, and I know that she's finished a first draft of it. Um, and uh, it's you know part memoir, part investigative journalism, uh, really kind of digging into the history and culture and science of voice hearing. Um, so keep an eye out for that book. I'm going to guess maybe a year from now or so, The Echo uh, by Alison Smith. So that's, those are my, those are my pitches. <laughs> Thanks Ruth. And, and without Annie, we wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have connected either. So. Exactly. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's so. right. That's right. Um, Claire and, and, and Jeannie, any, anything else you just want to add or, or say in, in closing here? I'm just so pleased to have been able to be part of this panel. Um, thank you to Derek and Remy for organizing it. And thank you so much, Ruth, for you know, um, your willingness to join us. And it's always wonderful to be part of anything with Jeannie. <laughs> so, but thank you. And thank everyone for being here. And thank you to Leah for, um, for organizing us all. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. I want to mention before I say one more thing about that, um, I did mention that it's difficult to find groups. What I meant by that on the HVM website is it's very disorganized and especially post COVID, many of those groups are not running or they're running online and not in person. And so I do know that Caroline Carlton, who's a board member and a lot of you probably know Caroline, she's she's an HVM trainer that's been all over the world. Um, she fields the emails of, at info at hearingvoicesusa.org. And if you're trying to find a group from the list or the map and you're not really getting anywhere or you'd like her to help you kind of just match with an online group, she's, you know, I know that's not another email that would be helpful for her, but, but you can reach um, info at hvnusa.org um, and get maybe a list of groups that are, are active there. As someone mentioned, there are tons of groups, um, but it's just weeding out what's actually accurate on the website mm -hmm. is really a challenge right now. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody, Leah. You're in Italy. Thank you for <laughs> staying up very late for us. Um, <laughs> Sarah, I agree. Anytime I get to do anything with you, Derek, it's been wonderful to spend time with you. 
Um, and Ruth, you are just such a like beacon <laughs> of light and you Aww. just have such a peaceful energy. So it's been, um, I was really nervous and it's been really mm. powerful and calming at the same time. Um, and I do hope that we get to maybe see you at a World Hand Voices conference. I, I hope or... so. I <laughs> hope we can meet in person even someday yeah. face to face. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys so much for inviting me to be a part of this and Derek and Remy for putting it all together. Yeah. And, and yeah, poor Leah, she must be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Leah, we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. It looks like the next ISPS webinar will be about some of this intersection between housing and homelessness and, and um, hearing voices. And I think even care court. So, so stay tuned for that. And I'll, I'll give a shout out to just to the Wildflower Alliance is a really incredible example of people doing advocacy, not just with and for voice hearers, but really looking at, it's an important time. There's these new conversations about police that are opening up. There's new conversations about um, identity, you know, and all of these, it's, a, it's an important time for social movements to be building together, I think. And, and I think the Wildflower Alliance is really doing that. So if you're interested in social action, you know, take notes on, on their work. Mm. Um, and it's just been really incredible to be here. And as Jeannie mentioned, the groups, HVAN groups are also free. So if you have a $5 or maybe a hundred dollars or maybe, you know, a thousand, I don't know. And you, and you feel moved to make a donation to, to keep supporting, um, this kind of work in the world. Um, I know Leah has been sharing that information in the chat and, um, and it's certainly, we, we appreciate it and hopefully we can get, you know, get some help answering these emails and keep getting this, this, uh, make, making HVN spaces available to people. Um, so we can, you know, keep doing this thing together. And, uh, thank you, Ruth and Claire and thank Jean you. so much and Leah for hosting us. And yeah, thank you. 